Is the fear of AI taking over your job a reality? Or are we on the brink of a new era of job creation and innovation? Well, in today's episode of Tech Talks Daily, we're going to dive deep into the world of AI with Orr Hilch, the Chief Data and AI Architect at JLL Technologies. And he's going to bring a unique perspective from the heart of Israel, a hub for groundbreaking AI advancements. And we're going to explore how AI is reshaping the workforce, but also why there is a surge in demand for new skill sets and what this means for the future for knowledge workers in 2024 and beyond. So our conversation today will be around AI, artificial general intelligence, AGI as well. We're we're going to discuss a few implications around that and also want to question is the age is it agi that we should be worried about or the immediate impact of ai on our jobs and those ethical considerations such as bias that surround this topic so we'll shed light on all this and also draw uh, some of the and also hopefully draw from his extensive experience at jll where he's at the forefront of integrating ai into real estate advisory services Now, before I get today's guests on, it's time for me to mention the sponsors of Tech Talks Daily. And in an era where digital security is non-negotiable, legacy managed file transfer tools, they simply don't cut it now. So that's where KiteWorks comes in. Revolutionising the MFT landscape with unparalleled security credentials, including the much-coveted FedRAMP moderate authorization. This isn't just about compliance, though. It's about offering a secure, efficient platform for today's remote workforce. So with KiteWorks, you can benefit from advanced file sharing, email security, and customizable integrations, all within a platform designed to safeguard your most sensitive data. So don't let outdated technology compromise your security. Step into the future of secure managed file transfer. Get started today by going to kiteworks.com. That's kiteworks.com where security meets sophistication. But now it's time to get today's guests on. So buckle up and hold on tight as I beam your ears all the way to Tel Aviv, where we're going to try and demystify the complexities of AI with today's guest. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? My name is Or or Hilch. I am the Chief Data and AI Architect at GLL. Uh, Jones Glenn with Sal, a CRE services company. I have joined the company following the acquisition of my startup, Scal and AI, uh, where I was one of the co-founders and CTO. Um, so I've been doing technology and prop tech for the past six years now, uh, and part of a bunch of other uh, other cool stuff. Uh, yeah, so excited to be here today. I'm excited to have you on here because there's so much hype around AI at the moment, but I think we're starting to look beyond that hype and starting to talk about, hey, well, how can we use this? How's it going to make our work better? How's it going to make our life better? How can we work alongside it rather than replace people with it? And with AI predicted to reshape job markets similar to past technological revolutions, and we have here, we have been here many times before. So how do you envision a future of human AI collaboration in the workplace? And how can organizations better maybe balance technology adoption with that intrinsic human need for social interaction and trust in professional settings it's such a, a huge balancing act isn't it yeah it certainly is and i think um ai has been actually helping us out uh to achieve our goals more efficiently for quite a few years now i think it it, it is getting uh smarter and smarter it is hard to keep pace yeah. um but if you do uh if you look at like uh, historically and the way uh, you know we have been using AI, how it changed our work. So it's it's fairly safe to say that you know uh, the way that we do our work is always changing. Uh, but there's but usually the, it is the case that you know because of AI we're able to do more work, uh, uh, and then it always ends up with uh, you know humans just doing more and more business. Um, and I can give you an example, like a personal example, right? So I I started my career as a software developer. Uh, and that was about 20 years ago, right? Um, and when you consider like uh, programming 20 years ago, it really looked nothing like it is today, right? So, you know, we used to have, so like the generation that preceded me were actually using punch cards, right? Actually doing zeros and ones in machine code. Um, my generation started writing a language, which is like a really low level language 
which requires you to understand things like memory management and the structure of the processor and all of these things. Uh, and certainly with, you know, when, with the years of past, we have been introduced to higher and higher level languages, like initially it was C and then C++ and then C Sharp. And now you have like super high level frameworks like React from Meta. Uh, so that essentially, if you if you want to draw a button to the screen, you don't have to know about the you know quantum mechanics of how the transistor works, right? Um, and I think all of that has been made possible uh, with uh, you know with uh, we actually with AI um, with things like compilers that you know they take the you know the computer code that you write in some high level language and they compile it all the way down to the zero, zeros and ones that the machine can understand. Uh, and if you, and then I think there are two observations here. Like the first is, if you consider like the number of developers in the world that when I started like 20 years ago versus today, so you have like, you know, thousands and thousands more developers today compared to, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and the reason is that it, it has become a lot easier to write code and a lot easier to build things. Um, and I think AI is kind of like a direct step in that. And we can see it with things like GitHub Copilot from Microsoft. Uh, that automatically writes code for developers. And I think this is kind of like the next level of abstraction. Uh, and just like writing code, let's say in a 2020, was very different than writing code in, a, in either 2000, it certainly will be a different task to write code in the next 20 years compared to today due to AI. Um, but my take is that it's probably going to proliferate the, you know, the number of developers just as they did like you know uh, 20 years ago. And I think... Um, I, I, I'm guessing that we're going to see the same in many other business lines. So, you know, we certainly see it uh, in GLL, uh, where we are already applying AI to make stuff more efficient. Uh, and usually the case is that we may just end up do, doing more business. Yeah, it's so true what you're saying there. And as I said a few moments ago, we have been here before. If we go back those 15, 20 years ago, there were no cloud computing architects, mobile app developers. Exactly. Pod- Podcast producers, ride share drivers, social media managers, UX designers, virtual assistants, such a long line of new roles that have come as a part of technology. So considering the widespread discussion though around AI's potential to both automate and create jobs, any insights that you can share on on maybe what sectors you foresee experiencing the most significant transformation and, and how workers and companies alike should be preparing for these changes right now? Yeah, so I think, first of all, I think everyone should be preparing in the sense that, you know, uh, you should be using the AI tools and no matter what you do. So if you're in marketing, you can tools, you can use tools like Jasper and whatever to, you know, make your content writing more efficient. If you're a coder, you, you should be using GitHub Copilot or the equivalent. Um, and, if you're in the, and if you're in CRE, you should definitely plug your CRE data sources uh, into some AI engine that will just make you more efficient in your work. And I think kind of if you if you look at the segments that are probably most poised for disruption, it's it's uh you know because like I think like most of the AI revolution that we're seeing in recent years is about large language models, um, which naturally makes the language heavy areas uh, more prone to change. Um, so if you look at uh, you know themes like legal, right? So legal is super language heavy. Uh, and then even the GLL with our uh, proprietary LLM, GLGBT, we are seeing a lot of our legal staff using it to analyze contracts, to make the, the diligence process faster. So every area which is language heavy is probably more poised for disruption. Um, in CRE, um, that also includes things like leasing. So, you know, there are a bunch of these like super long lease agreements uh, that could be complex uh, to analyze. And this is a, a great area uh, for AI to help us with. Uh, same goes for things like that property valuations, uh, where you need to write pretty lengthy reports. Um, so all of these areas that are language heavy are probably going to be uh, uh, be the first to uh, you know to enjoy the revolution. And something I was thinking about the other day is the two different sides of the coin. Because on one side we've got the rapid advancement in areas like generative AI, but on the flip side of that, there's also relatively slower progress in things like robotics. This got me thinking. How do you assess the current state of robotics in AI development? And are there any challenges and opportunities that lie ahead for integrating more advanced robotics into various industries? Because again, there's so much going on in this space, isn't there? Yeah, so so that's a super good point. Um, and you know, I actually this is a discussion I have a lot with my colleagues about 
you know, it's like it's it's certainly true that uh, well, while robotics is did advance in the you know the first uh, in the last couple of years, uh, the pace of progress in uh, in every and everything that's hardware related is always uh, much slower compared to software, right? Because it's so much harder to iterate with hardware. You know, you have to build things, right? Um, so uh, I think that uh, in that sense, um, you know, the relatively if you look at like uh, the type of work. Uh, that requires actual physical presence from people to do, right? So, you know, operating machines, um, you know, everything that's, uh, you know, everything that's, you know, that, that actually demands like, uh, uh, you know, these motion type of skills. I think these will be the last uh, professions to be disrupted by AI because robotics is simply not there yet. And I think generative AI actually is helpful uh, in the progress of robotics because many of these robotics labs, they use simulators. Uh, to improve the hardware. Uh, and JDI in that sense is really helpful because it can generate a lot of synthetic data. Uh, so these uh, these uh, training simulators could be a lot more efficient now. Um, but still, I think it's, it is definitely true to say that it's lagging behind as you, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, um, so yeah, and I think this is the duality that we've always seen between hardware, hardware and software, uh, and AI is the same. And as AI changes, uh, the the nature of jobs, such as anything from programming and document review in the legal industry, what are your thoughts on how professionals can maybe adapt to these evolving roles and how significant the role of creativity and innovation is to staying relevant in an AI-driven job market? Because th there are so many different skills, more human-related skills, that AI cannot compete with. It's almost like we need to leave the machines to do that repetitive, mundane, boring stuff and get back to being human and, and move away from the robotic tasks, right? Yeah, that's exactly true. And I think, I like the, you know, the skills that are going to be more and more important, uh, I think are uh, around the things like language. That's like the first, right? Because uh, finally enough, the way to get these AIs to do stuff is using natural language. Um, and then the better your grasp the language is, uh, you know, the better you can, uh, the results you get from the model. Uh, and because most of the written content uh, on the web, which is what these models are trained on, is in English, uh, then it's actually uh, probably the case that, you know, the better you would be in English, the more you could leverage these technologies. So I think having a really good grasp of, grasp of language, and especially English, would be more and more important. Um, it, it, it all it's, it has always been important, but I think it's just going to get uh, you know, more important. Yeah, and I think the second the second thing is like, kind of like what what I kind of like uh, feel uh, as a developer using AI is that many of us are kind of like becoming analysts in a sense. So you know, we're talking to the AI, we're asking the AI to do something. Maybe I want the AI to write a function for me or to do something else, and then I spend most of the time reviewing and kind of like. Uh, uh, making small fixes and actually asking the AI to fix this and fix that. Um, so I think kind of like, uh, it's still definitely the case that uh, you need the uh, the end-to-end -end understanding uh, of things to be able to get uh, the AI to work well, uh, at least in things like software engineering. But I think it's kind of like uh, it's probably going to be the case that you know you, you know how it's like in, in universities they always. Uh, uh, kind of like focus on theory uh, and not so much necessarily on practical stuff, right? So one of the, you know, one of the uh, of the complaints students always have for universities that teach computer science is that, you know, we focus on things like algorithms and theory and not so much about programming, right? So like when when they, when you are like a fresh graduate out of university, your programming skills are okay, but then you actually learn to program in the job, right? Um, and then this was like a, a complaint that students would always say. But now it's, I think that's kind of like the, uh, the I told you so moment of university <laughs> because uh, it's kind of like, it seems like the actual uh, technical programming still is becoming less and less important and the actual understanding is becoming more important because in this age where most of the coding could be done uh, by AI, it is actually the understanding that's more important. Um, so that's, uh, that's, I find that interesting. And also, of course, with the emergence of prompt engineering as a critical skill set in the tech industry, anything you can elaborate on the unique blend of skills required for success in a field like this? And is anything that you foresee in the demand for prompt engineers influencing the 
the broader tech hiring landscape because that that demand for prompt engineers is something I'm seeing more and more in our news feeds now. Yeah, so I think kind of like um, I think it's uh, it's still the case that you know it doesn't it doesn't matter to what business line you would hire someone. Yeah. It's probably still the case that um, you would want them to have a, a domain expertise, right? So you could be, you know, I would like to, let's say, if you consider one of the many business lines that we have at JLL, uh, which is around CRE, uh, tech leasing, for example. Um, so while good prompt engineering skills are definitely important, we definitely also want the candidate to have a good grasp of the, grasp of the business. Um, so I think it's still uh, it's still uh, quite far in the future until we see like a pure prompt engineering jobs. Um, uh, it would always be coupled uh, uh, with domain expertise, at least in the short term. Uh, yeah, but that certainly ties into I think uh, our earliest conversation about uh, about the you know the grasp of language, right? Because eventually, prompt engineering is it's it's all about kind of asking the right questions the right way, and you need to have a good grasp of, of the language, and you know, in order to uh, in order to achieve that. And I'm curious, if we reflect for a moment on the evolution from writing machine code to using high-level programming languages, how do you see AI further transforming the role of programmers? Are any implications that it might have for the education and training of future software developers too? Because, again, so much going on, and I know it's moving at such a fast pace right now, and it's difficult to, to know where it's heading. But how do, how do you see this evolving? Yeah, so so definitely. I think, um, I think it's like... It, I would say that I would kind of divide my answer into two. First, kind of like what we're seeing right now and what we'll probably see, you know, in the next, let's say, five years. I think that what we're seeing right now is that AI is making developers at least twice as efficient, right? So the same developer could probably write twice as much code or produce twice as much delivery in the same time. Um, and that's super helpful, but that still requires the developer in the loop uh, because... Uh, the AI is really is really uh, is really great at kind of like writing the you know the boring stuff, but when it comes to end to end to actually being able to deliver a, a working uh, let's say working application or something like that, uh, it's still quite lacking. Um, I think that the way that we we see this evolve in the future is that and that I'm talking about at least let's say five years from now. I think that most developers um, will probably be. Uh, and I would say there would be two types of jobs for developers. Like one would be uh, the architect type of role, right? So you would have the uh, the developer actually, um, you know, they would need to know uh, what they want to do and not so much how they want to do it, right? Let's say they would you know, they would need to specify, hey, I want my application and it needs to have uh, a database. It needs to have uh, maybe it needs to run on the cloud, right? It needs to have turn our uh, security measures and authentication methods and all of these things. I think many of the question of the of the how would be left for the AI. So in that sense, developers would still need to know about the different components of the application and they could still specify them. Uh, and and that that only makes sense because you know there are different requirements between writing software, let's say in a startup versus a corporate in an enterprise, right? Um, so you'd always need this architecture function. Uh, the developer does today. They will all probably need to do it in the future as well. Uh, but many of the how would be left for the AI. So that's like, I would say, one type of, of uh, engineering job I imagine in the future. And the second is really something which is, I kind of, it's probably what I, what, I, what I referred to earlier as a code analyst. Um, it's, I think it had something to, it's also quite similar to quality assurance in the sense that you would need to look at the results, you need to look at the code. And kind of like verify it and see, okay, that that, that action does what I what I expect it to do, right? Um, and there are of course ways to automate that as well. But I think that we we, we probably will want developers to actually uh, do the verification at least like in the near future. Yeah, so I think that's that's how we're going to see the the profession change. And if we go back just a few weeks, there were some controversial discussions at the World World Economic Forum about the potential for. AGI to mimic human thinking. Uh, what are your views on the ethical considerations and, of course, safeguards necessary to ensure AGI benefits uh, society without disempowering humans? Because whenever we talk about any form of AI, it's not long until we start talking about the ethics and the 
dangers of moving fast and breaking things because we've kind of been here before again too. But what do you see are the developments here? So I think uh, my take is that it's we have like I would say more urgent uh, ethical concerns about AI. Yeah. Um, uh, for instance, you know we can look at things like bias and uh, potential ethical issues with you know the outcomes of other things. And this is an issue that I think we already have today, right? And we are working hard to mitigate. And I think that the, these are more like practical issues that you know we are seeing in the wild, right? Um, and they are defining the type of things that I think we we as a kind of as, hum, as humanity need to solve probably before worrying about AGI because AGI it's like I would say it's still very much unclear like if and when we are going to be able to build that. I think yeah, when when AGI happens, it will change everything. But uh, but kind of like my point of view is that you know it's still so far in the future that it's really hard to hard to even imagine what the challenges would be. So you know you could go back as far as you know the development of linear algebra and matrix multiplication, it's like you know like hundreds and thousands of years ago, uh, which is today uh, you know the technology the technique that uh, it's underlying uh, all of uh, the GPU computations, right? So whatever eventually when you when you look at these uh, high-level AI models that we talk to, uh, eventually they compile to neural networks, which are further broken down into uh, metrics multiplication operations that are being run on GPUs, right? And I think kind of like trying to worry, like worry about AGI right now is it's almost like worrying about uh, AGI back when you know someone developed the metrics multiplication hundreds of years ago, mm-hmm. uh, because I think we are so far away from creating something which would be like a uh, a, a, a true, uh, you know, general purpose uh, type of uh, intelligence thing uh, that it's, it's it's quite premature. Um, and part of part of that why is by the way, it's because I think many times when we think about AGI, we actually think about human level intelligence or something which is you know it might be superhuman, but it, it is a human style intelligence. Uh, but it's actually the case that human intelligence is also it's also quite specialized, right? Um, we don't really have a, a, an example of nature or someplace else to, you know, an, an, an actual uh, generic type of uh, uh, intelligence. Um, so I would say, yeah, we definitely need to worry about the ethical concerns of, of AI, uh, but that's not something new. I think that that was also a concern, you know, in the days of deep learning, uh, when we, you know, when we use things like credit score algorithms and stuff like that. Um, they might have biases based on the training data. And I think that that that's a much uh, that concerns me a lot more than you know, kind of like a futuristic thing um, with AGI. And something I try and do every day on this tech podcast is learn more about the impacts of technology, the benefits of technology in every corner of the world, not just Silicon Valley and the Bay Area. And as someone based in Tel Aviv, Israel, or AKA Startup Nation, a renowned tech uh, hub over there. How do you perceive the impact of regional difference in AI development and adoption? And are there any unique challenges or advantages that you face in Israel in the, the global AI landscape, if we zoom out and look at that bigger picture? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I think, generally speaking, I think there is something quite uh, uniquely local to AI, and that's the the fact that if you actually want to develop a, you know, a foundation model, you need to have a lot of resources. Um, and if you look at these type of like foundational model providers, uh, you don't see them coming from, uh, you know, from most countries in the world, right? You, obviously, you have the US leading this, right? Uh, you have uh, the UAE uh, with TLI and the, and the Falcon model, which is uh, one of the largest uh, open source large language models. Uh, and you actually have one in Israel too, uh, from a company called AI21. Um, so I think, um, in that sense, I think Israel is uh, interestingly in this game, in this race for uh, LLMs, even though it's a relatively small country. Um, I think, kind of, kind of, uh, like, like in many other areas of tech, you would see uh, uh, the Israeli startup nation focusing on things like cybersecurity, uh, and indeed you have a bunch of AI startups around that field here. So a lot of LLM security, uh, more broad AI security. So that's the type of things that we're seeing around here. Fantastic. Exciting times. And I cannot thank you enough for coming on here and sharing your uh, your insights around everything AI and AGI today. But before I let you go, I always like to have a little bit of fun with my guests. So 
I'm going to ask you now, if you look back at your career, what's the funniest or most interesting story that has happened? Because I would imagine that you've, you've picked up a few stories along the years, but anything stand out that you could share anyone uh, that sh- you can share with anyone that is clean and you're able to share, of course? Yeah, so uh, fortunately, I actually had a lot of funny stories about the mistakes I made as a programmer. <laughs> and I think one that uh, one that uh, I might share today is that uh, when I was like uh, sort of like in the beginning of my career, I was a uh, software engineer in one of the large banks uh, here in Israel, uh, and I was working on this campaign uh, to basically uh, distribute uh, call from the call center to the bank's clients. And, and offered them some uh, some kind of banking service. I think it was something like a pension fund or whatever. Uh, and then you know, when I was writing the code to generate, I was supposed to write the code that generates the actual uh, phone call activities on the CRM of the call center. The call center had like I don't know, like maybe 40, 50 people working on working working for it and just making the calls all day. Uh, and then you know you know how it is if you look at the like database systems, you have uh, tables, for example, with the client names and things like that, and their phone numbers. Uh, and then you have the data fields that, you know, they're also always supposed to have a value, right? So if you consider something like, you know, the ID of a person, you would expect that to always have a value, right? Because no person has no ID. Um, so when I was uh, writing the code to generate uh, the phone call activities for the CRM, I was uh, assuming that, you know, that, uh, that field will actually always have a value, but it did turn out that uh, there was this one client who actually, for some reason, probably a bug or whatever, did actually have a value for their ID, and therefore um, my prob my program ended up creating like hundreds of and hundreds of phone call activities for the call center, all towards the same person. <laughs> so that person got like hundreds of phone calls, like like during one hour, and he was not happy about it, but. Uh, but eventually, uh, everything was settled. So yeah, that's that's kind of like one of the stories I always remember. <laughs> what a great story! I absolutely love it. And for anybody listening, just wanting to find out more information about your work, what you do, uh, any of the topics we explored today, or just contact your team. Uh, where, where's the best place to start uh, and learn more about anything we talked about today? Um, so first of all, we have a lot of great content on the GL website concerning uh, prop tech, AI in CRE, and AI in general. You can always feel free to reach out to me on my LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm always happy to chat. Perfect. Well, I'll get the link added to your LinkedIn and the website and the social channels for JLL Tech too. I love chatting with you. We covered so much there from how AI will actually increase jobs as previous tech revolutions have proven in the past many times, as we've said a few times here. We've been here before and also our occupations such as programming, document review and writing. Most won't disappear. They'll just take a different shape, a different form, and that isn't unique to the AI era either. And also, of course, looking to the future, such a demand right now for AI skills, prompt engineering, really diversifying the tech hiring landscape, and for the better as well, I would argue. But more than anything, just thank you for bringing this topic to life with me today. Yeah, that's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on. I think it's clear that the narrative around AI and jobs is not about replacement, but transformation. Because the rise of Gen AI, LLMs and diffusion models almost heralds a new age of job creation, demanding a blend of technical and soft skills like we've never seen before. And whether it be the emerging role of prompt engineers or the evolving landscape of programming, the future is bright for those that are ready to adapt. And today's guest reminds us that the innovation knows no bounds and even the smallest nations can compete on the global stage this is not just about silicon valley that's being impacted here so for anyone eager to dive deeper into ai's impact on jobs ethics and beyond i'd love to hear your thoughts on this how do you see ai reshaping your industry good bad indifferent i want to hear it more and also how you're preparing for the jobs of the future. So share your thoughts and join the conversation by emailing me, techblogwriter at outlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Love to hear your thoughts on this. So I'll return again tomorrow with another guest, but until next time, keep looking forward to the future and maybe learn to embrace the change that AI could bring to our world. Maybe it's not all bad. Let me know, but I'll be back again tomorrow. So until next time, don't be a stranger. <laughs>